Hey, and welcome to uh, Monday's uh, Dow MMT. I'm continuing on with this uh, textbook MMT where I am uh, reading directly from the macro macroeconomic uh, textbook, uh, as you the, the one that's on the screen right now. And I am on chapter 10, which is money and banking. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, share, and hit the bell if you want more. Okay, so 10.1, introduction. In this chapter, we have several subjects, uh, some uh, objects, you know, I'm worried messing up. <laughs> uh, several objectives. First, we will introduce students to commonly used definitions of the money supply. Frequent reference has uh, frequent reference has been made in earlier chapters to the purchase on or sale uh, financial assets by both the government through the central bank and treasury, as well as uh, by banks. Here we will provide students with a clear understanding of the generic characteristics of these financial assets. We, we then devote space to developing an understanding as to how Banks, uh, I'm sorry, bay, uh, how banks behave in the modern monetary economy. In the process, we will expose some long-standing myths about the role that banks play in the operation of the financial system. And 10.2, some definitions, monetary uh, aggregates, e econ economists and commentators, draw inferences about the economy from trends over time in monetary aggregates. Several measures of monetary aggregates have been devised over the years, but there is some variations, uh, variation across countries in, in what components are included under each measure. The different me uh, measures published by central banks are sometimes summarized as M0, M1, M2, M3, and M4, and reflect varying degrees of liquidity, uh, convertibility uh, into cash, or that's, that's, that's basically what it means. It is common to you consider highest liquidity measure MO or M, M0 and M1 as narrow money while M2, M3, and M4 are considered to, me uh, to measure broad money. M0 is also termed the monetary base. In countries such as Australia and, uh, and the UK, it includes circulating notes and coins held by the non-government sector, including banks, the deposits of banks with the central a uh, bank generally called reserves and other central bank liabilities to the non-government sectors. In the USA, the monetary bank, uh, sorry, monetary base is defined as in the same way, but the term M0 is not used. Monetary base is the most liquid measure of the money supply and is also uh, sometimes referred to as high-powered money, or HPM, due to its use as a reserve uh, as a reserve that is leveraged to private banks that issue their own money de denominated liabilities such as deposits. And one typically comprises notes and coins in circulation plus current bank deposits held by the private non-bank sector in some uh, nations. It includes traveler's checks and deposits accounts that checks can be written against. It is also uh, a liquid measure of the, mon the money supply because its components are readily available to the use to be used for uh, spending on goods and services. I'll be right back. The U.S. Federal Reserve defines M2 as M1 plus most savings accounts, money market accounts, retail money, market uh, mutual funds, and small denominated time deposits or certified 
or certificates uh, certificates of deposit of under one hundred thousand. But now we see these as far as the last part goes. M two is a less liquid measure of the money supply and movements, and it are typically used to forecast inflation. M three broadens the me narrow measures to include less liquid components such as long term time uh, long term time deposits. Even uh even uh, even bates okay well, hold on even okay sorry even broader still are m4 measures which add other liquid assets to the aggregate such as borrowings from the private sector by non uh non-bank financial in intermediaries not all measures are published by all central banks the u.s for example only publishes the monetary base N1 and M2. In the UK, there are only two official money supply measures, M0 and M4. The European Central Bank publishes M1, 2, and 3. While in Australia, the Central Bank publishes uh, 0, 1, and 3, and 4, or broad money measure. Uh, 10.3 Financial Asset Location uh, Section. If a household engages uh, in saving a or a flow period of time uh, over a number of months uh, or years, then it will uh, accumulate a growing stock of wealth. The household needs to decide whether to continue to add its savings, saving to excuse me, to add its saving to its existing deposits, or I mean, at its bank, or put together a portfolio of financial assets which have different degree, uh, d degrees of risk. For example, stocks uh, or shares or bonds and are also denominated in the money of, of account. <clears throat> and treasury and modern economies issue bonds which are debt of various maturities, also called securities. These financial assets are, are bought and sold by the central bank, private banks, and the private sector. Private entities, for example, and corporations, also include uh, also issue bonds. In general, the bond acknowledge, uh, acknowledges that the issue uh, issuer is indebted to the bondholder. The bond issue issuer must pay interest to the bondholder on a periodic basis and repay the principal face value of the of the bond even or sorry when the bond uh, matures bonds represent wealth for bond, for bondholders thus a bond is a formal contract to repay a loan or iou with interest as fixed intervals the bondholder is a lender or creditor. The borrower is a debtor. He issues uh, the bond and the coupon is the interest rate paid on the face value of the bond and usually printed on the bond. In these cases, the periodic interest payments are constant. The issue price is what investors pay for bond when it for the bond when it's first issued. Later bonds may be traded at a premium or above par. Uh, of good quality so that there's a minimum de a default risk by the issuer or at a discount or private below par. The bonds of currency issuing government carry zero default risk because such a government can always meet its outstanding liabilities. For this reason, these bonds are very desirable in times of uh, uncertainty. A council is a special type of bond called a perpetual per Perpetuity, perpetuity, okay, perpetuity. There we go. That's what, I think that's what the word is, which means that there is no maturity uh, maturity date. Interest is paid on it on this asset forever. When we talk of the government bond market, we need to d differentiate differentiate uh, between the primary and the second secondary bond markets. A primary market is the inst institutional machinery by which the government sells debt to the non-government sector. While many mistakenly believe that the issuance of bonds in the primary market is designed to raise funds to facilitate government spending, the reality is that currency issuing government are, governments are not financially constrained, see example chapter one, and therefore we can, we must 
seek a different explanation of why such a government issues debt at all to the government, uh, non-government sector. We deal with these, those questions in more depth in Part E of this textbook, which uh, right now I think I'm in Part B, but anyway. Uh, yeah, Part C is next. Uh, part B of that part. <clears throat> excuse me. Part E of this textbook, Economic Policy in an Open Economy. A secondary market is where existing government bonds are bought and sold by interest interested parties after the bonds enter the monetary system via the primary market. The same arrangements apply, for example, the two private share issuers, also called uh, equities or stocks. The company raises funds via the primary issuance process, and then its, share, and its shares are traded in secondary markets. Government bonds are thus negotiable because ownership of the certificate, certificate can be transferred or sold to another owner in the secondary mar bond market. However, it is important to understand that once the bond is issued, the subsequent trading has no impact on uh, at all on the volume of financial assets in this system since it just shuffles this wealth between wealth holders. The process of insurance and uh, yeah, insurance uh, issuance, there we go, to in primary markets varies across nations uh, and has also varied over time. A typical arrangement in that pa in the past was that government bonds would be sold to, sel to selected dealers for example, banks, on a periodical basis in the primary market. Government would de determine how much debt is wanted to issue uh, or express in the money unit of account and set a yield it was prepared to pay to the merchant or purchaser. Excuse me. The terms uh, offered by this take-it-or-leave-it approach might not be attracted to the non-government sector at the time, of offer so they shortfall so any shortfalls for purchase of what the government desire to issue would be taken up taken up by the central banks. This is a case of government issuing debt to itself, which brings down uh, which brings into question the whole logic of issuing debt. In the late 1970s, the, the dominant school of economic thought was uh, monetarism, which uh, erroneously claimed that central banks' purchased, uh, purchase of debt would, infl would be inflationary. Governments fell prey to that logic and started to devise ways to preclude their central banks from purchasing unsold debt. Governments would thus set uh, yields, uh, uh, devise uh, and sell as much debt as possible, but would continuously adjust the yields up or down to meet the market requirements and ensure that there were no uh, discrepancies between net spending fiscal or fiscal deficit and bond sale revenue. The system gave way to a pure a pure auction system, which avoided any claims that uh, the government was manipulating yields. Again, in response to calls for more free market activity, these auctions are uh, or tender uh, system began became dominant internationally. In general terms, the Treasury would announce the terms of this auction, including how much debt was available for sale, maturity dates of the debt, and the coupon rate, the or the, peri the periodic interest to be paid on the face value of the bond. The issue would then be put on the uh, out for a tender, and then the bond, uh, bond dealers in the primary market would determine the final price of the bonds issued, thus taking discretion discretion away from the ele elected government in terms of the yields that it would pay on a government uh, debt issuance. As an example, uh, imagine a $1,000 bond had a couple of 5%, uh, had a coupon, a couple, but a coupon of 5%, meaning that you would get $50 per an, uh, annum until the bond matured, at which time you would get $1,000 back. At the time of issue, the bond market the dealers desired a yield of 6% to satisfy their profit expectations. In this case, the initial uh, specification is unattractive. 
prior to the adoption of the auction system, private bond dealers was would avoid purchasing the bond under such conditions. But under the auction system, they would put in the purchase uh, purchase bid lower than the one thousand dollars to ensure that they got the six percent return sought on the prices that the price that they were willing to pay. It is important to understand that there is an uh, inverse relationship between the trading and traded price of a fixed uh, income bond and its yield rate or in, rate of interest. Why is this so? The general rule for fixed income bonds is that when the prices rise in secondary markets, the yield falls and vice versa. This is because if one pays more to purchase a bond, the couple, uh, the coupon payment represents a lower a return on the purchase price. On the other hand, if one pays less, then the coupon payments represent a higher return. Furthermore, the price of, the, of a bond can change in the marketplace according to interest rates fluctuations, even though the bond holders will still only get the face value of the market back upon maturity. When interest rates rise elsewhere in the economy, the price of previously issued bonds falls because they are they are less attractive to uh, in comparison to the newly issued bonds, which offer higher coupon rates, uh, reflecting the current interest rates. When interest rates fall, the price of older bonds increases as they become more attractive given the newly issued bonds offer a lower coupon rate in the older, higher coupon rate bonds, or rate of bonds. The coupon, uh, wait, uh, the government <laughs> department, excuse me, the, uh, the government department that manages these auctions uh, process receives, uh, receives tender from the bond market in, primary, uh, bond, uh, in the primary bond market. Uh, these will be ranked in terms of price and implied yields desired and the quantity requested in dollar terms. The bonds are then issued in order of the highest price bid down until the volume of the government desires to sell is achieved. So the first bidder with the highest price or lower yield gets their desired volume as long as it doesn't exhaust the whole tender, which is unlikely. Then the second bidder, higher or higher yield, uh, receives their allocation and so on. In this way, it, in this way, if demand for the tender is low, the final yields will be higher and vice versa. Bonds are also issued and sold in primary markets by state or provincial, provincial, uh, provincial uh, governments, include uh, multinational and local companies, uh, credit and institutions, and other public bodies. Companies can finance new capital investment by one or more of the following: uh, I, uh, which is insurance bonds. Uh, oh, no, sorry, no. One is insurance bonds, two, uh, issuing retained profits, and three, launching a new share issue. Treasuries and other institutions uh, use the bonds with different times, uh, different times to, uh, to maturity. For example, the U.S. Department of Treasury issue bonds of one month, three months, six months, one year, two year, Five year, seven year, 10 year, 20, uh, 20 year, and 30 year durations. A 10 year uh, treasury bond insures in 10 years, and so on. Yield concepts and fixed income investments. The yield indicates the return that will be returned from the investment and, a u and is usually expressed in percentage terms. There are several concepts of yield that are used in the markets. And with that, we will be right back. Welcome back. We are in the yield concepts in fixed income investment category. Coupon or nominal yield. If a bond has a, fa a face value of 1000 and is paying 8% in interest, the coupon rate, or that would be the coupon rate, 
then the nominal yield is 8%. The investor will thus receive $80 per annum, uh, annual, I guess, uh, until maturity. The coupon yield remains constant throughout the life of the bond. Current uh, yield. Suppose you purchase an 8% $1,000 bond for $800 in the sec secondary market. Uh, irrespective of the price you pay, the bond entities uh, entitles, you now, entitles you to receive $80 per year in uh, coupon payments. But unlike the previous example, the $80 payment uh, per year uh, until maturity represents a higher current yield than 8%. On your uh, on your investment because it is based on your purchase price of eight hundred. The uh, the actual yield is eighty or eighty or eight hundred equals ten ten percent. So to compute uh yeah to compute a current yield you simply divide the coupon by the price you paid for the bond. In general, if you buy the bond at a discount to face value, the current yield will be greater than the coupon yield. And if you buy at a premium, then the current yield will be below the, the coupon real the coupon yield. Yield to maturity or YTM. The current yield uh, does not consider the difference between the purchase price of the bond and the principal payment at maturity. Uh, YTM, again as yield to maturity, considers that in addition to earning interest, an investor can make a realized capital gain or loss by holding the bond until the maturity date. Yield to maturity is a measure of the investor's true gain over the life of the bond and is the most accurate method of comparing bonds with different maturity dates and coupon values. In box 10, there's a uh, worked yield example. Uh, it goes to the same thing as I just said, basically, uh, except it adds a few things. So let me just go through that, just be accurate uh, or more detailed anyway. Assuming or assume you pay $800 for a $1,000 phase value bond in the secondary market, the $200 discount on the phase value is considered income or yield and must be included in the yield calculations. Assume that the 8% uh, $1,000 bond has five years uh, left to maturity when when bought for a hundred uh, comparison of a three yields concept uh, concept gives uh, one a coupon uh, yield of eight percent of eighty or eighty dollar income uh, flow divided by one thousand phase value uh, a current yield of ten percent uh, eighty dollars income flow divided by eight hundred discount purchase price. And year, uh, wait, is that year to mature? Uh, yeah, year to mature uh, of 13.3 percent. The working is given in the main text, uh, okay, above in this case. Oh, uh, maybe it is below <laughs> on the second page on the other page of uh, I think it's uh, 151. Uh, the comp computation of year to mature is complex and can be simplified to the following rule of thumb. But your uh, YTM equals uh, C plus PD, uh, which I'll get to, I'll get to PD here pretty, pretty soon, uh, slash 0 0.5 times FV uh, plus P. So where C is the coupon, PD is the, the prorated discount, uh, FV is the face value, and P is the purchase price. So PD is different, uh, the difference between the face value and the purchasing price or purchase price divided by the number of years to a maturity. If the bond is a trading or at a premium, the PD uh, is a negative, which means that the uh, year, uh, year to maturity is less than a coupon yield. Using the data in a worked example, uh, therefore, uh, the YTM equals five, uh, 80 plus 200 slash uh, five, I guess five years, uh, slash uh, 0 0.5 uh, times 1,000 plus 800 equals 120 uh, slash, nine, uh, slash 900 minus 13.3%. 
When bond traders talk about yield, they are usually refer- referring to the year to uh, year to uh, mature measure, which is the only measure that takes into account the effect of principal price, coupon price, and time to maturity of a bond, uh, actual uh, bond's actual yield. There are two ways we can use data on yields by government bonds of different maturities to assess the state of the economy and the degree at which, to which the non-government sector expects inflation to increase in the future. We have seen that raising yields signal weakening prices due to falling per- private demand for the assets in question. This could reflect a strengthening economy with investors being prepared to acquire more risk assets and less very safe ones. Uh, uh, Yeah, I want to make sure I got the last part right. This is also usually when the central bank pushes up the target interbank rate and bond yields more or less follow, uh, which would be chapter 20. Uh, further, we can use the movements in yields to gouge what is a gauge, uh, gauge, gauge uh, what is happening to inflationary expectation in the non-government sector. Rising yields on longer-term maturities indicate that the private markets sense inflation with ri- uh, will rise in the future, and so they desire so they so they desire to protect real yields by increasing. The nominal yields on the ba- on the bands on the bonds. The second re- the, the second way of looking at the yields is to consider the yield curve. The yield curve is a graphical depiction of the term structure of risk-free interest rates and plots and plus the maturity of different government bonds uh, government bond on the uh, horizontal axis against their respective yields. Our rate of return on the vertical axis, which is a, uh, I guess, figure ten point one, which would be here pretty soon, I guess, which shows that the U.S. Treasury yield curve for February, like say February third, two thousand sixteen. The there are various theories about the yield curve and its dynamics. I'll share uh, some common notion uh, notions in particular. That the higher is uh, that the higher is expected inflation, the steeper the yield curve will be. Other factors being equal, uh, all other factors being equal, the basic principle linking the shape of the yield curve to the economics uh, prosper- prospects is explained as follows: the short end of the yield curve reflects the interest rate set by the central bank, which sets the competitive rate and for cash, highly liquid assets in the economy. As the short-term uh, interest rates falls, the yields on other less liquid assets will follow, will follow suit. The steepness of the yield curve then depends on the yield of the long-term bonds, which are set by the market. But the short end of the curve is the, is the primary determination of its slope. In other words, the curve steepens uh, mainly because the central bank is lowering the official cash rate, and it's flattened, and it, and it flattens mainly because the central bank is raising the official cash rate. Both, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bond traders. There we go. Link the dynamics of the yield curve to other to their expectations of the future ec- economic prospe- uh, prospects that are expected to influence central bank interest rate policies. It must be remembered that if central banks raise interest rates, then then this will tend to cause prices of bonds to fall. This is, uh, this is called a capital loss. The prices of the bonds will, will uh, pre, uh, wait a minute, hold on. Prices of bonds with, okay. Uh, the greatest term to maturity will tend to be affected the most. And so long-term uh, bonds are generally subject to the greatest risk okay, of capital loss. I lost my place there. For this reason, there may be a link between inflation expectations expe- uh, expectations of central big policy and prices and yields on long-term bonds. In summary, there are three shapes that the yield curve takes can take. Normal, which is under normal circumstances, short-term bond rates are lower than long-term rates. 
The central bank attempts to keep short rates down to keep levels of activity as high as possible, and bond investors desire premiums in longer-term maturities to protect them against capital losses. Thus, the yield curve is upward sloping, as in the case shown in figure 10.1, which we'll get uh, soon, inverted. Sometimes short-term rates are higher than long-term uh, rates, and the yield curve is said to be inverted. When the, ec the economy starts to, uh, to overheat, the expectations of rising inflation that might induce the central bank to raise its target interest rate lead, lead to higher bond yields being demanded on assets with longer term. <laughs> Longer-term maturities. The central bank might respond to the building inflation, uh, building inflationary pr pressures by raising short-term interest rates uh, sharply. The bond yields uh, may rise. The significant uh, tightening of monetary policy causes short-term interest rates to rise faster, resulting in an inversion of the of the yield curve. The higher interest rates may then lead to slower economic growth. And yeah, there is a figure. Um, it goes from like say three percent all the way up uh, for the uh, for the uh, thirty year maturity rate. Anyway, um, you have to buy the book in order to know what I'm talking about on uh, one fifty two, which is the page uh, in the currency, money, and banking section of the book. Anyway, so now we're at the flat uh, uh, fiat. Excuse me, is it fiat? No, flat. Excuse me. A flat yield curve is seen most frequently in the transition between positive to inverted and vice versa. As the yield curve fat flattens, the yield uh, spreads drop considerably. A yield spread is the difference between, say, the yield on one-year and 10-year bond. But what does this signal about the future performance of the economy? A flat yield curve can reflect a tightening monetary policy or a short-term uh, rate rise. Alternatively, it might depict a monetary easing after a recession or easing short-term rates, so the inverted yield uh, curve will, uh, will flatten out. Moments in the yield curve are thus closely watched by economists due to the information that they convey about the general health of the economy possible central bank interest rate adjustment, and the inflationary uh, expectations in the non-government sector. Now, in uh, box 10.2, the orthodox approach to nominal interest rates determination, the Fisher effect. One risk is holding a fixed, uh, wait, yeah, one risk in holding a fixed coupon bond with a fixed redemption value is purchasing power risk. Orthodox economists who adopt the loanable funds approach to interest rates believe that most people would prefer to consume now more than it later. The encourage to encourage foregone consumption now a yield on savings must be provided by by markets. The yield is intended to allow a person to consume more in the future than had been sacrificed than had, than has been sacrificed now. But if the prices of goods and services increase in the meantime, the inf then inflation could completely wipe out any gain in real consumption. So that real interest rate is zero. Consider a personal consider a person invested in one year uh, one thousand dollar bond treasury bond um, coupon shipping treasury bond with an expe uh, expected single coupon repayment of one hundred. The individual would expect to get 1100 on the redemption date. Assume that over the holding period, prices rise by 10%. At, this, at the end of the year, a, ba um, a basket of goods, and previous, uh, goods that previously cost 1000 were now cost 1100 In other words, the investor is no better off at the end of the year as a result of the investment. The nominal yield has been offset by... The price inflation. Orthodox economists believe the investors uh, the, 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 believe that investors are motivated by real returns, not by nominal returns. This is because they knew and they view the decision to invest as coming from consumers who chose whether to consume now or to consume in the future. 
with consumption taking the form of real goods and services. If such savers do not take account of inflation, they, their future real consumption will be less than they desire. Orthodox economists pr propose that the nominal interest rates must equal a real interest rate plus uh, expect, expected inflation. The real interest rate is a supposed to, is supposed to be the market determined real return that will equate the saving supply of funds with the investment demand for funds. It is thus a real equi equilibrium interest rate. However, as contracts are written in nominal terms, that is, in terms of nominal interest rates, then normal rates must include compensation for the expected inflation rate. This addition to the real rate as inflation ex expectations rise is called the Fisher effect, named after the American economist Irving, F Irving Fisher, who identified this relationship in the 1930s. Many market, uh, many market participants believe the apply that this applies to the bond market, and there is a strong belief that nominal yields are adjusted by markets to preserve purchasing power. Purchasing power risk increases as the maturity uh, lengthens. This is one reason many uh, economists believe that longer maturity rates will generally be high, be higher. Excuse me. This market yield is equal to the real uh, rates, uh, real rate of return required, requ uh, required plus compensation for the expected rate at oh sorry of inflation. If the inflation rate is expected to rise, then market rates will rise to comp compensate. In this case, we would expect the yield curve to steepen, and given that Fisher effect would will impact more significantly on longer maturity bonds than at the short and the yield curve. Now we're at 10.4. What do banks do? The neoclassical view, the money multiplier. In most textbooks, banks are presented as financial intermediaries that take in deposits, hold a small fraction of the, these in the form of reserves, and lend out the remainder. The causality is from deposits to reserve to loans. If each bank follows these principles in, in making loans, aggregate lending expands through the deposit or money multiplier. For the moment, assume that all banks are required to maintain a ratio of reserves to de deposit of 10%. This might be to enable them to re readily respond to those of reserves resulting from uh, spending by consumers on goods and services, say, whose sellers bank elsewhere are customers seeking to hold additional cash. This is how the neoclassical school of thought describes the operation of the money multiplier. One, assume that customer deposits 100 in bank A. Number two, bank a, a bank a, reta uh, a retains $10 of reserves to perform to the required reserves to deposit ratio of 10% to expand its loan portfolio and increase profits. The remaining $90 is loaned to a customer whose deposit uh, whose deposit rise by $90. Three, the, cus the customer spends these deposits and the recipient of the funds or seller deposits $90 in bank B. Number four, Bank B then lends 0.9% or 9 times uh, 90 equals 81, keeping 10%, that is uh, $9, as additional reserves as required to a customer to finance their expenditure and so on. At each stage, the amount lent and then spent diminishes. It can be readily shown that if this was the way the Banking system operated, then 90, 900 uh, excuse me, of additional loans were are created within the initial new deposit. This means that deposits have been risen uh, by have risen by a total of one thousand and are backed by one hundred dollars of reserves, thereby conforming to the required ten percent ratio. This example is what the mainstream textbooks call a fractional reserve banking system, and uh, it purports 
to explain how banks create money, which increases the M1 money supply due to the increase in current deposits in terms of the initial deposit of 100. The multiplier is 10, which is the inverse of the required reserves to deposit ratio of 0 0.1. A smaller money multiplier results if the non-government sector chooses to hold more cash when credit is created. Note that no individual bank created money in this example, but the system as a whole multiplies the initial deposit of 100 into 1,000. At each step, each bank simple, uh, simply lends out 90% of the deposit it has received, uh, keeping 10% as reserve according to mainstream textbooks. The magic results from the fractional reserve banking. The larger the fraction of a deposit that, mo that must be retained as reserves, the smaller the multiplier effect following this logic. If the reserve ratio were zero, no reserves held against deposits, the banks would create an infinite amount of deposits after the deposit of just $1. The standard textbook example is typically assumed as a 10% ratio so that students can uh, readily calculate a, a money multiplier equal to 10. On April 12th, 92, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, for the first time in history, set the required reserve ratio on demand deposits at the magical 10% making theory uh, appear to coincide with reality, but that coincide, coincidence did not make the money or make the theory correct. As we will see next, the money multiplier as a description of modern um, banking is a myth and bears no relations to how banks operate in the real world. To summarize the dominant neoclassical, uh, neoclassical view, banks are conceived con uh, are conceived as being financial intermediaries that maximize profits. They take in deposits to build up reserves so that they, then they can then on uh, then on lend the deposits as a, at a higher interest rate. However, uh, prudent, prudential regulations require that they maintain a minimum res, uh, reserve to, to deposit ratio. The fractional reserve requirements mean that the result credit creation process is, is finite. In addition, many economists still believe that the money ba uh, monetary base, which consists of bank reserves and cash held by the non-government sector, is under the control of the central bank, thus by controlling the size of the monetary base and setting the required reserve ratio. The central bank is considered to be able to continue the size of the monetary, uh, the money supply or the quantity of money. Thus, in the neoclassical narrative, the money supply is considered uh, exogenous and determined by the central banks or central bank. This is an important claim because it has underpinned argument, uh, has it has underpinned arguments that central banks can cause inflation by allowing the money supply to grow too quickly. And then this follows the, quanti uh, the quantitative theory of money, or QTM, in Chapter 20. Uh, policy recommendation that central banks can fight inflation by slowing money growth, as we will see in, again, Chapter 20, and analyze, uh, analyze in Chapter 23. The QTM is a flawed conception of the inflation generation process. We will also de uh, demonstrate that the central bank does not have the capacity to control the money supply in a normal, uh, n uh, no normally functioning uh, money system. The implication of the operation of the money, money uh, multiplier is that the bank would forego profitable loan opportunities if it did not have sufficient reserves to enable additional credit recreation. Some allowance is made for discretionary uh, discretion. The deposit multipliers claim to be a function of interest rates and interest rates dif differentiate or differentials. Bank preferences regarding their holdings of excess reserves and also public preferences uh, regarding their holdings of cash as noted and time deposit 
and demand to positive ratios. However, as Bruner in 1968 demonstrated, these factors are of one of only minor importance. Be right back. Hey, and welcome back. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, comment, hit the bell, uh, share, and for more general uh, modern monetary theory material, you can go to realprogressives.org. Uh, you can also go to YouTube and not only just my show, but also look up the Real Scholar with uh, Steve Grumby, who's the founder of realprogressives.org, as well as New Parker Show. Uh, and also, uh, Steve Grumbine is also on Status Coup with uh, with uh, Jordan Sheridan uh, discussing various topics. Um, let's see, also, I believe that uh, Steve also does uh, Are You Ready to Grumble on uh, Status Coup as well. And is also interviewed on other things. Um, anyway, so you have, you have to look him up as far as YouTube. And just remember, uh, if you want to... Uh, subscribe um to real progressives you can go to real progressives real progressives in action on youtube uh facebook uh twitter pretty much anywhere that's a, a uh, media outlet uh anyway back to the back to reading uh textbook on monetary theory uh, MMT representation of credit creation process on page 154 is right by the end of the page. The neoclassical characterization of the credit creation process, which is driven by fractional reserve requirements, is not an accurate depiction of the way banks operate in modern monetary economy characterized by fiat currency and the flexible exchange rate. In the real world, the business of banking is complicated, but it is, but is in some respects similar to that to that of the profit seeking firms. Like these other firms, banks seek to earn profits and thereby generate return for shareholders, making loans secure secures profits as long as the banks are paying a lower rate of interest on the funds that they borrow, uh, making loans secure uh, borrow than they receive from uh, their customers who take out loans. Uh, first, a necessary condition for credit creation is that there are non-bank firms and or households who are seeking loans to finance their planning or planned uh, spending on goods and services or assets. Second, some of the some of these entities must uh, be considered uh, credit worthy by the bank so that there is a high probability that loans will be repaid in full. While constitutes credit, what constitutes credit worthiness varies over the business cycle and lending standards tend to become more lax and boom times as banks chase market share. Third, the banks must anticipate the, that there is a profit to be made by making the, these loans as described above. Banks make loans and independent, independently, inde independently. There we go. She's of their reserve positions. That is their holdings of reserve related to their liabilities. After organized, uh, originating loans, they will borrow additional reserves required by law or for clearing purposes. Bank managers generally neither know nor care about the aggregate level of reserves in the banking system. Certainly no loan officer ever checks the individual bank's reserve position before approving a loan. Bank, lender, uh, bank lending decisions are affected by the price of reserves and expected returns and not by reserve positions. If the spread between the rate of return on an asset or security or a loan, uh, and the cost of borrowing reserves is wide enough. Even an even a bank that is already deficient in reserves will purchase the asset or make a loan and cover the reserves needed by purchasing or borrowing reserves in the interbank market. 
The interbank market connects the banks which lend reserves to and borrow reserve from each other uh, other than, uh, oh wait, other each other when needed. There we go. The important point is that when a bank originates a loan to a firm or a household, it is not lending reserves. Bank lending is not easier if uh, is not easier if there are more reserves, just as it is not harder if there are less uh, are less. Bank reserves do not uh, fund money creation in the way that is claimed in the money in the money multiplier and fractional reserve deposit story. Banks do not wait for deposits to come in before they make loans. The main difference uh, difference between banks and other type, types of firms involves the nature of the liabilities. Banks make loans by purchasing the IOUs of borrowers. This results in a bank liability, usually a demand deposit, at least in the initial initially. And that shows up uh, as an asset of the borrower. Thus, a customer of a bank who secures a loan is simultaneously a creditor of the bank due to holding a demand deposit, but also a debtor to the bank. They, these creditors will almost immediately in, uh, exercise their right to use the newly created demand deposits at a medium of exchange for purchases of goods and services or assets. Bank liabilities, bank deposits, are used by households and non-bank firms as a transaction in the form of checks or transfers. Customers can also redeem demand deposits at uh, banks of, wait, uh, at per or uh, at par dollar for dollar against fiat money, which is guaranteed by the government, to enable cash to be used for purchases or making payments that are due. The government would also accept some kinds of bank liabilities and payments of tax of payment of taxes. In turn, bank reserves are used for payment or interbank settlement among banks and for payments made to the central bank. Thus, when bank creditors draw down demand deposits by either spending or choosing to hold more cash, a correspondent loss of reserves for the individual bank results. The bank may then uh, either sell an asset or increase its liability or borrowing additional reserves to cover the loss of reserves. The interbank markets, called the federal fuzz market in the U.S., functions to shuffle the reserve balances that the member uh, private banks keep with the, with the central bank to ensure that each of these banks can meet its reserve targets, which might be simple, simply zero balances at the end. For a specified specified period of time, the uh, that for simplicity we could assume is a day. Not assume, sorry, could assume is a day. Uh, to aggregate, uh, in aggregate, uh, however, such activities only shift reserves from the one bank to another. If more reserves are needed in total, they must be a they must be a supplied by the they must be supplied by the central bank. Far from waiting for deposits before they create loans, banks in the real world expand their balance sheets by lending as described below. You can also check out the Fed, um, go into like, go into like, um, I use Bing as a search engine, uh, but you can look up Fed uh, uh, H8, uh, and we'll have a report of the uh, liabilities versus assets. And that's what I mean. That comes down like, uh, man, I think like once a well, once a month or once a week or some type of effect. Either way, when I look it up, it 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 has like an August or September or whatever the case may be. So, look that up if you want more information in regards to like the fluctuation of pretty much anything that is asset related or liability related or you know the balances between as far as the part goes. I'll also show you the fluctuation of. Uh, how much, uh, say, a car loan, or how, or a uh, house, uh, housing loan, or uh, or a uh, property loan, or something to that effect. That will show that. So they will also show you uh, how good or how bad the economy is in regards to uh, lending against uh, uh, something in regards to that. Anyway, uh, loans create deposits, as I was pretty much just explaining. Uh, loans and free deposits that are then backed by reserves after the fact. The process of extending loans or credit 
which creates new bank liabilities as uh, unrelated to the reserve position of the bank. In the pursuit of profit, banks take applications from credit-worthy customers who seek loans and assets uh, at assets <laughs> and assets. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, assesses them kind of thing. Uh, uh, according to the uh, Verity, uh, I guess Verity of the application. Uh, although, uh, in lead up to the global financial crisis of 2008, the validation process became very lax. The only thing that constrained the bank loan desk uh, expanding credit in, is a lack of creditworthy applicants, which can be due to banks raising the qualification standards in times of pessimism, or can occur if creditworthy customers are loath uh, loath to seek loans because of future uh, uncertainty. The major insight is that any balance sheet expansion that leaves the bank short of the required reserves may affect return at can expect on the loan. This is consequent that this is a consequence of the penalty rate rate the central bank might exact through the discount window, the central bank facility for lending the, to banks in need of reserves, should the bank fall short of the reserves it requires at the end of the day to cover the claim on it. However, it will never impede the bank's capacity to make the loan in, in the first place. It is thus quite wrong to assume that the central bank can influence the capacity of banks to expand the credit by adding more reserves into the system. We will address this um, proposition in more detail in uh, Chapter 23. Uh, banks do not loan out reserves. A cor corollary of the loans that create deposits insights is that banks do not loan out reserves, which raises the question of what role do bank reserves actually play? Banks must hold reserves balances with the central bank as part of the payment system. The reserves are used to make interbank payments. Each day, millions of inter and transactions on are re reconciled or settled through, the, through these interbank payments. For example, checks drawn on bank on bank A and deposited at bank B will see funds transferred from bank A's reserve balance to those of bank B. If a particular uh, if a particular bank finds itself short of the quantity of reserve necessary to resolve all the daily claims against it, then it can first try to borrow reserves from other banks that might have uh, excess reserves in relation to their requirements on that particular day. But as we will see in Chapter 20 and 23, an overall shortage or excess of requirements on that particular day, oh excess of reserves across the banking system must be rectified by the central bank, uh, which provides reserves to banks in the case of shortage, of a shortage or may drain them from the system in the case of the uh, access. The central bank intervention is what we refer to as liquidity management role and allows the bank to manage the overall level reserves so that there is a consistency or consistency with its um, interest rate target. For example, if any particular day there is excess of reserves over and above quantity required to settle transactions, and the central bank does not offer any competitive return on them, banks banks holding those excess will try to loan them out overnight, which has the effect of driving down short-term interest rate. The central bank must drain those reserves by selling government bonds to the bank in, in, return, to, uh, in re return for debits to the reserve accounts to ensure the overnight interbank uh, interest rate remains equal to a desired policy targets rate. We will learn more about this in 23, or in chapter 23, rather. Um, endogenous uh, money. We have stated that unlike the story presented in neoclassical textbooks, in the real world, the central bank cannot control the money supply. In other words, the money supply is endogenous, money in the sense that the supply of money, of bank money, is determined uh, indigenously by the demand for bank loans plus the willingness of banks to lend, which gives rise to the creation of deposits. The neoclassical theory erroneously believes that the money supply is 
exogenous and determined through the money multiplier interacting with the money, the monetary base, which neoclassic, uh, neoclassics uh, believe to be under the control of the central bank. The demand for bank loans to be determined by the spending decisions of private e uh, economic agents, including decisions regarding asset purchases. These can be affected by, by only, but only very indirectly by the loan rate of interest. Banks supply loans only because someone is willing to borrow bank money by issuing an IOU to the bank or to banks. This means that the interest rate cannot be determined by the supply and demand for loans since supply and demand are not independent. Rather, banks are price setters in short-term retail loan markets. They then meet the demand for loans with some uh, quantity rationing at that price. In other words, some requests for loans are, ref uh, are refused, even uh, where uh, aspiring borrowers claim to be willing and able to pay the ongoing interest rate. There can be several reasons for quantity rationing at large segments of, of the population. Banks might worry about the default risk of some borrowers, but might not be uh, able to raise interest rates sufficiently enough or sufficient, uh, sufficiently to cover the default risk. Quantity rationing is then superior to price rationing, that is, raising the interest rate charge to some borrowers. Also, banks probably have better information than do borrowers about default risk. For example, the borrower who wishes to open a new restaurant might not have accurate information about bankruptcy rates and the bankruptcy rates in the industry or might simply be overly optimistic. On the other hand, banks can never know the future, so most also must operate based on rules of thumbs, for example, informal rules that restrict loan size. Some quantity rationing can even be irrational, perhaps discriminatory, because banks have traditionally for, forgone certain kinds of loans or, or are reluctant to lend to certain groups in the community. They, the, the key point is that the supply of loans does not sim uh, simply adjust to the demand for loans at some interest rate. The, the short-term retail interest rate can be taken as a markup over a short-term uh, short wholesale interest rate, exactly what determines the markup or and whatever is var uh, variable to is controversial, but not uh, important to our analysis here. Uh, you can see more in 1988, okay, uh, anyway. Uh, wholesale interest rate. Finally, uh, our under influence of central bank policy, individual banks are wholesale markets to rectify a mismatch between retail loans and deposits. Most banks will not be able to will not be able to exact reconcile the retail loans and, de and deposits. Some banks will be able to make more retail loans than they can retain in, in deposits and thus suffer a loss of reserves while others will find fewer loan customers than depositors so they will have a surplus of reserves. Banks then use wholesale markets to either purchase reserves by issuing wholesale liabilities. For example, negotiable large denomination certificates of deposit or CDs or, okay, so I was wrong earlier, uh, or by borrowing central bank funds. While a surplus bank will sell uh, their excess reserves as discussed above, the central bank sets the overnight interest rates or interbank rate. This rate then determines other short-term wholesale rate, mainly by marketing or marking up, but also marking down through uh, arbitrate. <clears throat> Summary. The uh, neoclassical position is that banks leverage uh, create uh, credit when provided with new deposits, but, but are constrained by fractional reserve requirements. Since the central bank is, supposed, is supposedly able to control the monetary base, base, it is claimed that the central bank can control the supply of money. Reflecting what happens in, in the real world, MMT demonstrates that the central bank cannot control the 
monetary base because monetary policy is conducted by the central bank setting the target interbank rate and provide the right level of reserves to the banking system so that banks lend to and borrow from each other at this target rate. For more details, we'll see chapter 20 and 23. Second, a bank is not constrained by its reserve position in deciding whether to make a loan to a particular customer. If the customer appears creditworthy and the loan is prop profitable to the uh, to the bank, it will make the loan and then require uh, acquire sufficient reserves by borrowing from other banks or the central bank. Thus, in contrast to the neoclassical position of deposits driving loans, MMT shows that the loans drive deposits. Third, taken together, the, grow the growth in the broad money supply is driven by the demand for loans and the monetary base adjusts to the pressures that the indigenous, I always want to say indigenous, uh, endogenous, endogenous uh, monetary growth places on the central bank in the quest to sustain uh, a particular policy interest rate. Hence, the supply of money to, is determined uh, endogenous, uh, while the price of money short-term interest rate is uh, determined exogenous by central bank policy. I mean, you never know if I'm ever going to be able to get that get those uh, uh, pronunciations right. But anyway, hopefully you understand what I'm talking about there. Anyway, uh, an example of bank's credit creation and balance sheet analysis. The balance sheet of a typical bank looks like uh, looked like in the figure 10.2, which um, is assets versus liabilities. I'll just say that. Which uh, the assets uh, have advanced loans, securities, reserves, and other assets, while the liabilities have check account, checking accounts, savings accounts, and other liabilities. Anyway, uh, so the entries in the balance sheet are checks and savings accounts. Note that they are IOUs of banks and hence appear as liabilities. The bank promises to convert deposits in a check account and check, check account and deposit in most saving accounts into cash on demand. Banks hold financial assets in the form of loans to consumers, uh, consumer, consumers customers, excuse me, and securities, that is treasury, debt, and other financial assets. Firms in general and banks should have positive net worth, which is the difference between total assets and total liabilities. Total assets in the left-hand co column with balance with the items in the liability column because the latter includes net worth. The following simplified series of balance sheets will clarify the process of credit creation by Bank A. Let us assume that Bank A starts with the, a very simple balance sheet in, in, uh, in uh, Figure 10.3, which is expressed in, in the terms of stocks. Its owners have raised capital and bought the building. The owner's equity or net worth is equal to the value of the building that they have purchased. Bank A has not engaged in any banking activity yet. Now, a customer uh, comes into the bank and says that they would like to borrow $200 to finance the purchase of a car. Cheap car. Uh, the bank checks their creditworthiness by asked for income tax returns, proof of assets, credit history, and so on. If the cus customer is approved, then the bank bank's balance sheet takes the form shown in uh, 10.4. Uh, the bank just uh, created 200 of uh, money entries, deposits in the check checking account of the customer in return for the customer's IOU or promise to pay 200. The bank's total assets, liabilities, plus net worth are now 400. Before we move on to customer spending of their of their deposit, let us examine this balance sheet and care, uh, careful uh, sheet carefully. There we go. Where did where did the bank get the money to entry uh, get the money entry created? A checking account was created. Uh, XO nine okay, that is from nothing. But enters uh, entry a number two hundred in a computer ledger on behalf of the borrower. In the past, banks could use issue uh, issue their own bank notes, but generally only uh, only. 
Central banks can do this, can do that now. The bank did not need any prior deposits or any cash in its vault. In fact, the bank did not have any cash in its vault, nor did it have any deposits in its account to or at the central bank in this simplified example. The bank is not lending anything. It has it. Uh, it has just created creates money entries that is bank deposits as at will. Those money deposits are entries are are its liabilities or IOUs. By creating uh, those banks IOUs, the bank promises to convert deposits into cash on demand, accept any of those IOUs in payment of debt and owed uh, owed to the bank. The check account uh, is just a legal promise to convert to cash or demand on demand and to accept payment in the form of the bank's IOUs or, or bank's own IOUs rather. The bank does not have to have any cash now. The success of the banking operation lending by accepting uh, an IOU and the creation of demand deposit depends on the capacity of the customer to repay, that is, their creditworthiness. If they have problems in making timely payments on their debt, this affects the value of the bank's assets and its own income and flows, and ultimately affects the, uh, the net worth of the bank and the ca bank's capital ratio and the shareholders' return on equity. The bank's capacity to acquire reserves uh, at low cost if the customer wants to withdraw cash the bank needs to pay debt to their uh, to other banks through an interbank settlement following the customer spending. Um, there's a chart below, which I'll get to in a moment. The bank needs to pay debt to other banks. Okay, so, so settlement. Um, the bank needs to uh, sell uh, tax payments made by the uh, tax payments made by the customer uh, the customer to the, to the government. So basically, in um, in Figure ten point four. Bank uh, a balance sheet showing uh, loan assets uh, is loan to customer plus one two hundred uh, bu uh, building uh, two hundred uh, check account of customer uh, plus two hundred and net worth two hundred anyway so let's see uh, if these conditions are not satisfied the banks get uh, bank gets into trouble it can become insolvent or look or uh, illiquid. Insolvency means that the bank's net worth falls to or below zero uh, illiquidity, means that it cannot meet cash withdrawals or clearing. Thus, even though banks can create unlimited amounts of money, uh, amounts of money, deposits, they have no incentive to do, uh, do so because they may become un unprofitable. What happens if the customer now pays 200 to a car dealer who has a bank account at a bank B, at bank B, the balance sheets at bank A and B look like figures 10.5, which is the check account of customer uh, minus 200 and reserves due to bank B uh, plus 200. And, uh, and uh, 10.6, that says uh, change in assets, claim on bank A reserves plus 200, change in liabilities, check account of car dealer plus 200. Uh, note that we are now just dealing with the change in assets and liabilities rather than their levels, or other than their, rather than their levels. Bank A liability in the form of customer of the customer's check account I have uh, dropped by 200 through the purchase of a car. But the transaction in uh, wait is not confined uh, confined to the redu to reduce balance in the customer's account at ba bank A and increase balances of the car dealer at bank at bank B. I'm sorry, I just said bank B, but I meant bank A, and the car dealership is at bank B. There we go. She's bank A now owes bank B two hundred and needs reserves to settle this debt but does not have uh, reserves where it doesn't get the reserves. Where does it get the reserves? The banks are required to keep reserves accounts at the central bank. These reserves are liabilities of the central bank and assets of the banks and function to ensure that the bank payments or settlements uh, system uh, functions smoothly. The system re relates to the millions of transactions that occur now, this, and that system relates to the millions of transactions that occur daily between banks as, as checks 
um, are tendered by citizens and firms and other bodies. Without a coherent system and reserves, Bank A could easily find itself unable to fund Bank B's demands based on the check drawn on the customer's account and presented at Bank B by the car dealer. Bank A will get the res reserves from the source that is the least costly. It may sell assets, but in our, but in our example, Bank A only has a building, so it would be very costly to get reserves that way. Bank A could sell bonds if it had any, or it could borrow reserves from other banks, domestic or foreign, or the central bank. A common way to get the reserves is to borrow from the central bank, which is the monopoly supplier of reserves. Uh, in, fi in figure 10.7 documents, the latest change to Bank A's balance sheet associated with obtaining these reserves all figure 10.8 shows the changes in the central bank's balance sheet. Now the balance, now the bank A has reserves and can settle its debt with bank B. The changes to the two banks' balance sheets are shown in bank uh, in figure 10.9 and 10.10. .10. The debt between the two banks has been settled. The financial balance sheet of bank A looks like figure 10.11. Bank A makes money as long as the interest in rece uh, it receives on the loan to the customer is higher than the interest it pays to the central bank on the reserves. The balance sheet of Bank B is shown in bank uh, in Figure 10.2. Uh, we assume that Bank B had reserves prior to their check account of that car dealer uh, the been being increased by the sale of the car to the customer. The final balance sheet of the central bank after all transactions is shown in figure 10.3 noted that none of these operations involved any transfer of physical cash. It was all bookkeeping entries conducted digitally through computer networks. Also note that, the, that we have only shown the assets and liability directly related. So going back to 10.7, changes in assets. Reserve on hand is 200 or plus 200. The debt in central bank is plus 200 is the change in the liabilities. 10.8 shows that central bank balance sheet shows loan, which again is reserve loan to bank A, which is plus 200. And reserve uh, uh, on the change of liabilities is plus 200. And then, and as I said, 10.9, change in assets, uh, reserves minus 200, and change in liabilities, reserve due to bank B is minus 200. And figure 10.10, 10, uh, changes in assets, as it sees, as I see, claim on, B, uh, on bank A is minus 200, and reserves is plus 200. And uh, figure 10.11, bank and found a balance sheet, Assets, funds advanced to customer, 200. Building, 200. Debt to central bank, 200. Net worth, 200. Uh, in the figure 10.12, bank B final balance sheet. Assets, reserves is 200. Liabilities is 200. Uh, ten, uh, figure 10.13, which I'll obviously I'll get into. Um, is assets uh, and liabilities and reserves loan to bank A, which is in the asset column is 200, and reserves is 200 in liability uh, category. Okay, so to our example, of course, private banks and the central bank have many other assets, liabilities, as well as a ne a net worth on their balance sheets. In practice, the central bank will usually not advance uh, reserves to the bank directly in the form of an unsecured advance. Instead, it will ask for the collateral, usually a treasury security, in exchange and will provide funds for less than the value of the collateral. So if Bank A has a $300 bond, say for instance, it surrenders it to the central bank in exchange for reserves. The central bank might only give the bank 285 if the discount rate is 5%. Discount rate is one way in which the central bank can try to limit the credit to creation in the economy. So, the conclusion it is insufficient and misleading to think the modern banks as intermediaries that take deposits and then lend most of them out while retaining some fraction and reserves. 
Instead, we should think of banks as making loans, accepting the IOUs of borrowers, then creating demand deposits that the borrowers can use to finance their spending. Banks mostly use reserves for clearing, uh, that is for settling payments with other banks, the central bank and then treasury and at the ATM when cash is withdrawn. Banks obtain reserves as needed either by borrowing them from other banks or through creation of reserves by the central bank. We, well, we will explain in more detail how and why central banks uh, accommodate the demand for reserves in chapter 20. Okay, so next one would be part 08. Okay, so let's see part C, as I uh, explained when I first started this today. Uh, national income output employment determination, then, uh, which is chapter 11, the classical system. That would be for tomorrow. So thanks for listening. I hope I didn't bar, bore you or uh, misread too many things, but I try to make sure that when I misread it, I go back and reread it in a better and try to do better. And if I mess up, I make fun of myself and go back to it. Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned from this. I hope you, uh, this um, inspires you to learn more about modern monetary theory. I hope this inspires you to look up people like Septi Kelton, Warren Mosler, uh, Steve Grumbine, um, Steve Keen, um, L. Randall Ray, Bill Mitchell, uh, people like that, uh, the architects of architects and educators of modern monetary theory. And again, I will actually try to put the um, Fed uh, H8 uh, report uh, in the uh, description below, and that will that link will take you to their uh, assets versus liabilities and. At least you'll get at least some um, reference to what I'm talking about as far as because if you don't know, uh, and also we'll try to put in the most recent um, Fed uh, daily statement, uh, which is basically just a bank statement of the day. Uh, but I think the latest I have is on the 15th, which is 19th. Uh, it appears they do it four times four times a week on the public uh, public uh, website. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching or listening in this case. Uh, subscribe uh comment uh share hit the bell and hit the thumbs up thank you and peace out for now